Thank you. I am extremely excited to be here. So first of all, thank you for everybody that is awake and watching me right now. Uh, I want to just mention that there might be some Spanglish in this talk because by 10 p.m. my English doesn't go 100% anymore. I don't think this is like a terrible thing. It just like makes things more fun, right? Uh, so today this talk is really a lot about um, how I changed from the person I, I was at the end of grad school. Uh, thinking about what I thought doing equity work was to after two years of a lot of after learning, a lot of after two of years, right, have made me realize of the things that I was thinking wrong and that I was understanding wrong. Uh, and this has, I think, a lot of consequences for everybody that is currently teaching or at university level, and I'll explain why. Before I start, however, I want to acknowledge that today I'm talking to you from the lens of, uh, well, actually, um, today I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So, but uh, the University of Michigan is actually on the lens of the Potawatomi uh, people. And the reason I think it's important to do country acknowledgements is not only because it's important to recognize that we live in a country that uh, colonized the own owners of the land, uh, that our universities are standing on this lens that indigenous students represent a really small percentage of the students that are on this on the schools so university of michigan you know is a very flagship important university right but less than one percent of the students are indigenous and this is because of colonization practices because the school actually has a lot of policies that make it really difficult to enter right and i think it's important for us to recognize those things in our own institutions and so if you don't know whose lens you're standing on i invite you to um, educate yourself and figure this out. Okay, so I'm gonna start by telling a story just to understand why this matters to me. Um, on my first year of grad school, uh, I was part of a project uh, that needed to present its results to the advisory board. And so many of you are, you are familiar with this mechanism, right? You're part of a grant and one of the ways NSF or NIH may wanna make sure that the money is being used to research that is producing something and that is sort of like what you propose or like what you are doing is correct is that you have some advisors that are researchers that are on your field that uh via some mechanism you'll show them what you're doing and they will sort of like give you some sort of peer feedback on it right uh so our grant had this mechanism as part of the evaluation and what they said to you was like let's invite them all to pittsburgh Right, let's have this like summit of three days. We'll show them how we collected the data, what we've done so far, right? It was it was like really three really long days, right? So this was in my first year. And by that point, I had already um, analyzed some data and had like the basis of what would become my first paper. And actually uh, the basis of a second paper. So I had done a lot for a first year, right? And my advisor was really proud of me. He was like, you know, you should have an opportunity to present to them because I think this work you've done is amazing. So I was so excited, right? I'm a first year, I'm an immigrant, right? Like, I was like, oh my God, I'm proving that I belong here. That like the chance this advisor took on me by taking me in their lab as an immigrant is like totally worth it. And so I stood up, gave my presentation. Um, and at the end of the talk, you know, you finish, it was really small, 10 minutes. And then you wait for people to give you questions, right? And so people, somebody raises their hand very important person in the science education field i say okay yeah i'll take the question and this person turns around and asks a question to my advisor and i was completely shocked right i was like wait am i invisible right is it because they don't trust that i know the answer and my advisor um said you know paulette did the research you should ask her and you think, okay, maybe this person got it wrong, mis like misunderstood, whatever, right? The next person is not gonna do the same, right? But this happened like at least five times. So five times people would raise their hands. I would ask, I will ask them to ask their question, right? And they will turn around to my advisor and ask the question to him. When this was happening, I was like feeling like a fraud. I thought maybe my English was not good enough. I thought that maybe uh, you could tell that I didn't know what I was doing. Um, or that like everybody was thinking like, who are they thinking like putting like a first year presenting this stuff, right? And so it was really, really hard for me 
um, I was already suffering from insecurities about my English, about whether I was being good enough at communicating, at writing, at presenting research, right? Um, I was in a different country where like the research culture is really different, right? And so it was really, really scary for me to be in that moment and thinking, well, what if I actually sucked at presenting this? And now my advisor is regretting taking me in as a student. Later that day, as this sort of like things go, we took them for dinner to a really fancy place. And if you're a grad student that it's something in these situations, this is one of the few occasions in which you actually get to try fancy food, whatever you're living, because you know, you're not paying for it. The Granis. And so we're in this really fancy um, French bistro kind of place in Pittsburgh called Legume. So if you're in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and you know this place, that is where we're having dinner. Um, and you know, we weren't divided, like it was a long table, we were spread there, like, and we as people of the research team needed to be spread among the people, right? So we're sitting down, one of them, um, a woman, she turned around to me and she asked me, hey, you're from Mexico, right? I was like, yes. And I thought for a second, right, this is, this was my opportunity to shine, right? She was like, and you went to college there, right? And I was like, yes, actually, you know, I went to NAM, best university, Goya, no? Este, <laughs> that is a picture of like the, the faculty of chemistry when like that in the year in the international year of the predict table, by the way, uh, that was my chemistry bench when I was doing organic chemistry. And so I was talking about how actually it was really good at organic chemistry and I love doing research that I even had a paper where I had been like a co-author, right? And even though I was like the fifth author, who cared, right? I was like an undergrad and I had made the six molecules that were my babies and I had like created them, characterized them. I had done the whole thing, right? And also I had done like an honors thesis, right? Where like I have did a mini synthesis, I have gotten the product, I even got a crystal and the x-ray to prove it. I was just so excited talking about it. And she, I was like, no, 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 that is not what I'm asking. I'm asking because like, how come you like doing statistics? How come you like doing quantitative methods in education, right? Because the thing that I was doing was using numbers to tell a story. I was like, I don't know, I like math, I always like math. She's like, but you're Mexican, right? And I was like, I, I, I'm, I seriously was quiet. I was not understanding the question. And she's like, you're not good at math because you're Mexican. And then she started asking me about my parents. Are my parents doctors? Are they engineers? Right? Like, did they went to grad school? And I was like, not really. And she was like shocked. It's like, what? Like, you're Mexican. Your parents are not STEM people or med people. And you like no math. Where do you learn it? She kept pushing me to like, and I was like, I don't know. Like, I learned to the Biden elementary school. Like, I don't understand what this question means, right? So it turns out, and, and some of you maybe. Like, oh my God, I cannot believe this happened. Some of you may be like, oh no, this certainly happens. <laughs> but I wanna give you an explanation of why this might have happened. You see, uh, if you look at math SAT scores in this country, you will see that uh, white cis males, right? On average score uh, 551, which is above the 50th percentile, right? However, cis women, cis Latinx women, uh, score on average uh, 462 which is below the 30th percentile. So if you're somebody that studies STEM, right, or any structure that like, it's on an introductory courses, this is sort of like this, the kind of data you have always in your head, right? White people score higher, people of color score lower, right? And if you're a woman, right, you score lower. And so to her, this is the lens she was looking at me by. She was a math educator, right? SAT math is the thing that is studied a bunch in math education. And to her, I was an anomaly. I was a Latinx woman, right? That had not only scored above the 30th percentile, right? Like I was significantly higher than that. Um, and also the other reason why she was shocked is because if you, um, so, so like I'm presenting this graph differently, right? So this graph is the score, right? The average score each of these people get. What I'm doing instead of is grabbing white males as the baseline, right? And all the other scores, I'm presenting them as like the differencing points with this 551 score. Uh, 520, which is the 50th percentile, I'm sorry. So white males score on average 31 points above that bar, right? Latinx women under 58, like minus 58. And this deficit that we would call an education gets reduced to an average score of two um, 
522 when your parents have a STEM degree or went to med school or grad school, right? So this is why she cared so much about these questions. But this is what's really confusing to me. You see, um, I grew up in Mexico, where as the United States, we're a very racist country. But if you know me, you also know that I'm really light skinned. And on average, somebody that is light skinned in Mexico will have more opportunities, will go to school for more years, right? They will be more privileged. And that was the life I had. I had a privileged life. I had gone to college. I had not had to worry about money. My parents were supporting me, right? However, when I moved to the United States, there was this process through which people saw me that is called racialization, right? So what we call racialization is when people perceive us as not ourselves, but the version of the culture they think or they know about, right? So whatever perception they have about what Latinx people is, they will see me through it. So it would not matter, right, that I had a chemical engineering degree. It would not matter that I had gone to the best college in my country, right, and one of the best colleges in the continent and the world. Um, what matters was that I was Latina and that this person was seeing me through that lens first, right? So that is what racialization means. And as I said, this is a consequence of not only past ways in which we present people, but also like current ways. It's a consequence of like the stereotypes you grew up watching in the media and the current stereotypes, right? And so as any non-white group, Latinx people are not really represented. We're not represented as doctors. We're not represented as smart. We're not represented as people that go to grad school, um, etc. right? So why should you care about this story? Besides the fact that it's um, like, you know, I hope you hope that your students don't go through this. Uh, if you're in any university in the United States post um, the summer of 2020, when uh, the United States decided that racism exists, um, you may have found that many of your universities are doing this sort of dashboards where they're presenting you with uh, enrollment demographics, right? And universities are attempting to be transparent about the demographics of the people that are entering, right? Both a student uh, demographics and staff um, demographics. I think that you may notice, right, is that even in schools where uh, the population of non-white people is high, this is usually not represented in the faculty, right? The other thing that you may notice about these things is that um, they're sort of showing with pride about how these numbers are going up over time. So for example, the <laughs> University of Pittsburgh is showing that between fall of 2011 to fall of 2020, the percentage of uh, somebody identifying as black has gone from a little bit over 6% to 7%, right? And so they're really proud of getting these numbers. The other reason why you should care about this is because um, even though this has been presented as progress, we rarely talk about what these variables mean. So when we talk about race, what do we mean by race? What do we mean when we group ethnicity with race? What do we mean when somebody says they're identifying as black, right? The other reason is that we're talking about people, not the number of people going up, right? But we're really talking about policies changing. We're really talking about how the university is adapting or changing to support people that traditionally have not been there, right? And when they're talking about graduation, we're talking about retention in really general terms, but we never talk about why are people, what are we doing in these universities that are making people live without a degree? Another example that might be closer to a thing you do every day is that if you're an instructor, now you're getting access to this really fancy analytics in dashboards like um, Canvas, right? Where you get to see the activity of your students and like how many assignments they have answered and like the grades. If you have YouTube videos as embedded through Canvas, you can even see how many people view it, right? Like you can see a bunch of data, right? But we're not talking about how instructors are interpreted this data. Not only like even from a, like, even if you're an instructor that has good intentions, right? How are you interpreting your da this data? Have you been trained to interpret this data? And what do these things even mean? Do they have a value, right? Do they have a meaning? You can name this activity, right? But what does activity mean? Does activity mean clicks? Does activity mean time? What does that even mean, right? 
And this has become increasingly important during the pandemic because these things have sort of like become sort of like proxies for knowing the engagement of students in your class, given that you don't get to see them physically, they don't get to be in the classroom, raising their hands, right? And so these companies have taken advantage of this and sort of providing you this data so you think you know the truth about what's happening in your classroom. But I'm here to tell you that uh, thinking about numbers in education is way more complicated than that. Uh, not only because uh, people can use them to tell stories that hurt others, but even when we come in with the best of intentions, um, even when we come in thinking that we're using processes that are unbiased, that are correct, um, most of the time, we're missing a huge part of the picture, and I will explain why. So I'm going to explain to you how it got here. Um, so as I told you, I, 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 I got actually a PhD in learning sciences and policy. Uh, the reason I got a PhD in learning sciences and policy and not in chemistry education is that when I started grad school, um, there were not that many chemistry education programs available and the location I needed to be, there was not a chemistry education available in that. And so like life sent me to school of education, right? So I, instead of spending five, six years in a department of chemistry, I spent five, six years in a social science department that let me tell you, uh, somebody that was trained as a chemical engineer was a cultural shock, right? This is like, at the beginning, I was not even sure what language I was speaking or who I was speaking to or if I, like, it was really confusing. But after this interaction that I told you at the beginning, I became obsessed with this notion of science identity. And the reason I got really obsessed with that is I thought after this experience, how do people stay? How do people keep going? What do people like keep fighting to become scientists, right? And so I thought all the answer was in trying to understand our resilience, our decisions to stay. And so I sort of like got to a point where I did my dissertation on this topic. And talked about how when we identify ourselves as science people, chemistry people, physics people, whatever you identify as, it's because you see, for example, chemistry, right? I see chemists, right? And I see how chemists act or what is the characteristic of a chemist, right? And I see those characteristics and I say, I have those characteristics. And not only do I have them, those characteristics are like so core to who I am. That if I were not to have that, I would not be polite anymore, right? And the other thing is that the moment we go to the community, we get acceptance. So if I go to the chemistry community and I get accepted as a chemist, right, then I'm getting this feedback loop of positive um, information telling me, yes, you belong here, right? So this picture is actually from the lab I worked in undergrad and they made me feel like I belong there. So like it created me a sense that I was a chemist, right? Then, you know, I spent all this time thinking about it, all the feelings we have while we're doing science, how we think science, how we learn science, anything that has to be the process of training scientists, learning to become a scientist, even thinking or dreaming about science, right? I, I thought about everything that is happening in our brains, right? Because remember, even though we call them effective resources, they're actually happening in our brains. Um, so I spent a lot of time thinking about that. And I published a bunch of that and I did a lot of work on that. But by the time I got to my postdoctoral research, um, I started to think about, okay, so how does the learning environment shape this thing? So what do we do in the classroom that changes uh, how we see people as scientists, how they see themselves, how they learn. And I started proposing mathematical models using statistics that would explain how uh, a particular thing in the classroom, like using active learning or using cards or using certain exams or certain policies actually impacted students' effective intellectual resources. And I felt really proud of that. However, something that kept being a problem to me is that when I was trying to model this mathematically, you get into the problem of how do you model cultural oppression? And by this, I mean, how do you model sexism? How do you model racism? How do you model the way chemists relate to each other that is different to what physics, physicists relate to each other? Mathematically, this becomes 
a really complex question, right? Not only mathematically, but also methodologically. Like, how do you create a measurement that does this? How do you do a survey? How do you put a number on it? How do you put a number to racism or sexism, right? And this was a problem I kept approaching and like fighting and fighting and fighting. And it was bothering me because I felt that the models I was creating were not actually telling the story they should. I'm going to give you another example. Uh, if you belong to the internet uh, and, and you're on Twitter, uh, there's this thing called chemistry Twitter, hashtag chemistry Twitter. I love you all. And so <laughs> if you're in chemistry Twitter, about once a year, at least, somebody will discover um, this sort of like letters PS used to write uh, to their students or the rules PS used to give to their students uh, like in the 80s or 70s. Well, actually, some are from the 90s. And that talk about uh, the expectations of what a grad student in that lab should have, like should live up to, right? And usually these letters talk about the number of hours per week, what things should be counted as outside work hours, like reading, uh, how many days you needed to be there, right? What you needed to do, etc. And they always paint this thing sort of as like a bare minimum. Uh, and sort of like also this like, you should be thankful to be in my lab. So why are you not working harder, right? And these things actually shape our beliefs of what is a chemist, right? A chemist is someone who spends 60 hours a week in the lab. A chemist is somebody that reads all these journals. A chemist is somebody that behaves like X, Y, and Z. And so these cultural expectations actually become those characteristics I talked to you about before that you need to ascribe to yourself in order to feel like you belong or in order to feel like you are he like you should be here. And they become the measurement others will use to define whether you belong on the field or not. The problem is that these things, or I, I'm sure you can think about a thousand examples like this, depending on the field you are, is not science. Something called epistemic ignorance. Epistemic ignorance is a term that we use. I know it sounds super fancy and it is like it sounds really fancy and like snobbish. But what it really means is that people in power have created these fake ideas about what a scientist is to create barriers to keep people away. So these things become the things that keep people that they don't want in out. And I'll give you some examples. The GRE. Um, those jokes that people make while you're in a meeting, but you know you cannot like complain about because a super powerful full professor did them and nobody's going to tell them they're inappropriate. Um, how people comment on how you look. Um, and all those feelings that you have in your head. Uh, and when you act a certain way, people will be like, well, you're being too emotional. You're being too angry. You're being blah, right? A real scientist is not X. So how, again, I'm going to go back, right? Everything that I just told you, I'm pretty sure you agree with it. How is that captured in your learning analytics dashboard? How is that capture in the analytics the university is providing you to prove they're becoming diverse and equitable? When we do an education paper and we say this thing is helping students or this thing is not helping students, how do we account for it? Well, I don't I cannot say I have got into the total answer of it, but I have gone into a point where I can say uh, first of all, hire me and I'll spend the next 10 years or the rest of my career studying this and you will not regret it because I'm going to be awesome at your department. But two, uh, this is something we should care about. So I propose this thing called the Resources for Equitable Activation of Chemical Thinking Framework uh, or REACT. Uh, and the way it works is that it's in order to think about what I was talking about at the beginning, right? What the student is, what's going on in the student's brain what is going on in the learning environment, what are the policies of the university, right? And what is the culture of science that we're studying? And then we can use this framework theoretically to say, okay, currently science is driving somebody like me, right? Queer, immigrant, cis, Latinx woman, 
of color and wants to turn her into this perfect emoji-like version of what a woman scientist is. Uh, preferably, you know, really smart, but also quiet, uh, really driven, but that won't complain too much. Um, and like, I don't know, I can think of many other examples, but you, you're getting my drive. Okay. Ya no sé ni qué más decir, pero you got it, right? And so instead of that, I want you to think about, okay, what if instead of that, because currently what is happening is this, uh, if you're any group of marginalized system, you come to chemistry, right? And you're engaging into this thing called epistemological border crossing, where you're on the one side acting like they want you to act. And when you leave science, maybe go to your family or go to your friends that are not scientists, or maybe the people that you actually trust, you actually kind of let go and be these other things, right? And so you're like in this constant balancing act, uh, flipping one and the other, one and the other. And so you, you're forced to be in this border where you don't belong to one world or the other, right? And you're crossing constantly back and forth. Um, but when we start changing culture, when you start changing policies, right? Um, you actually support this negotiation of contradictions and tensions. And what you're going to do is expand the borders, right? Of what we define as chemist or scientist or physicist. And suddenly we're not crossing the border anymore, right? So theoretically, now we have a framework. Now we have a mechanism to explain why this is happening or what needs to change, right? And again, how do you model it? Right, like, this is great, right? It sounds super fancy, sounds super smart. I'm like, you know, sounds really smart when you read it. Um, it has a lot of fancy words in a book chapter, even has a peer review citation, right? So how do you model this? Can we even model it? Uh, and so this is when I became a fugitive where I decided that positivism was not helping anymore. And I'm going to explain you why. And I know, like, you're a scientist, you're like, what do you mean positivism? Like, what do you mean objectivity is not working? Why do you mean, like, like, why are you doing this? Right? I'll, I'll, you see. The current way we do research and education is this. We found a gap. We find a gap, right? Uh, women don't do well in science. Men do better. We simplify the model. Right, we grab all this thing that is a mixture of many um, misogynistic, racist, ableist systems, and we really simplify it. We go measure something. We plug the data in our studio, in SPSS, in whatever, in Python, whatever your favorite software is. You get a pretty graph, uh, and you publish the paper. You get claps, claps, claps. You get your citations, right? And then, that, like this, is literally how it goes. Um, so let's do this, right? So one of my first papers, paper in 2018, called The Effect of Math SAT on Women's Chemistry Competency Beliefs, right? Remember this whole math SAT idea. So in this paper, basically what I'm saying is when women get their math SATs back, they get a hit into their science identity, into their sense of belonging, into their beliefs that they can do science, right? And that hit, right, makes them more nervous, makes them like more anxious and they underperform um, in science. That is sort of like the crux of the paper, right? So I found a gap, you know, math SAT. I simplified my model. I say the problem is how women are interpreting their like uh, scores that affects their grades in Gen Chem 1. Um, problem, right? First of all, I'm saying we women are interpreting this uh, scores wrong. Instead of saying, right, like, we get this social pressure that tells us that, like, a lower score means that we're not good enough. Uh, so, again, we're not modeling sexism, right? We're modeling me as a problem, me, woman, as a problem that is misreading the thing. The other problem is that I'm using the word gender uh, when actually in the data set, even though I did collect gender, this model is only using cis people. And so, basically, the way I treated the data right, because the number of trans and non-binary people was really small and in quarantine methods, you need numbers. I literally erased a group of people and I put them away, right? 
I literally did this. I admit I did this. I, I did harm by erasing them completely. And nobody said anything. When I said on my methods, I took this group of people away, nobody blinked an eye. Um, and I use words like the effect of gender, right? The effect of then this person, the effect of being born as this woman makes me do this. So for all intents and purposes, if you read this paper, mathematically, it's perfect, right? I follow all the rules. I, I go through all the steps. My regression model makes sense. I, I make sure all, all the like eyes were dotted, right? Like everything, right? But then when you actually start looking at not only my interpretation, but like the variables I chose, the source of the variables, right? That are consistent with the state of the science in education, right? Nobody blinked an eye. Everybody was like, yeah, you're doing things perfectly. Would you get to this idea that like, people would say that the way I treated my data was subjective because I fulfilled the checklist of what a quantitative paper should have and how you should treat the data and how everything should be done. And nothing can be more objective than, than this truth, right? And we're getting to the truth because it's quantitative, because I followed the scientific method. However, right, what this is doing is, as I said, not only erasing a group of people, it's also erasing the way women experience science, right? It's totally erasing this whole cultural sexist thing. And so people that study things qualitatively, right, that actually go and speak with people and ask for their feelings and thoughts and experiences would say, well, the problem is that you're using the master's tools to try to dismantle the master's house, like Audre Lorde would say, right? Numbers have been historically used to hurt marginalized people. Ergo, you cannot use numbers to find our liberation. I still do quantitative methods. And it's not because I disagree with Audre Lorde. I will never, I will never disagree with Audre Lorde. It's because the master's tools is not numbers. The master's tools is white supremacy. And what I'm going to do now is explain to you why the way we do statistics today is actually tinted with white supremacy. So even when you come in to do statistics and education with all the best intentions, it's going to be really hard for you to get to a point where you're addressing liberation or equity because the base is rotten and we don't talk about it. So here's what happens. I'm going to introduce you to Francis Galton. Francis Galton, British uh, fancy person, used to live a long time ago. I don't know. He was really rich and he was really fancy. Um, he was a cousin of Darwin. And there was two things Francis Galton loved in this world. He loved charts. He loved the book, The Origin of Species by his cousin, Charles Darwin. So Francis Galton was one of these people that thought he was really, really smart. And he saw his cousin Darwin and say, oh, my cousin Darwin is really, really smart. And they could be like, wait, the moment the Galton and the Darwin family sort of married, right? And they started having children. Look at all the smart men, emphasis on men, are coming out. Wow. Right? Like smart with smart produces smart men. Again, emphasis on men. Right? And so he would make this chart, he would see this. And then he he when he read Charles Darwin Origin of Species, which has nothing to do with intelligence measuring or anything like that, right? But but see but, but talks about this whole idea of evolution and like the better species survive and blah blah blah. He was like, what if, right? I apply the principles of the origin of species to people. And so he started working on things sort of like to say, can I predict a child's future height based on their parents? Right? Simple enough. And so he started asking to a lot of parents about like their current height, right? And then he would measure children, like children's height. And he sort of found this like correlation, right? Um, and so he was like, okay, I can forecast, I can predict stature. Right, so that was step one. So he created this thing called linear regression. So he's the one who mathematically proposed how to do a linear regression, right? So he was like, look people, we can use this method to predict things. 
this is great, right? People rejoiced. We have a mathematical model that is simple, right? Because we're simplifying things to a line. And there's fairly a lot of number of things that we can like apply to this model to predict things. This is great. We can predict things, right? Science. But actually, Francis Galton is not like, I mean, he should be known for like the regression thing, but it's usually not talked about for regression. He actually is very talked about it because he's the father of a field. And no, the field is not education statistics. The field is uh, eugenics. Francis Galton believed that white people were inherently the better race and that using predictive models, we could say who should marry whom to how to create really smart children. And ergo, a great race. Uh, he created the journal. He did all of the thing. And this sounds really, really bad. And I know you may think it was like, yeah, this is one bad apple. But if you know the history of science, eugenics was like a pretty uh, important thing in science for a while. A lot of scientists subscribe to like that belief, even if that was not their field, right? They believed on the things eugenics was saying. So this is not like a small group of people, right? And he also, because of being the father of it, trained a bunch of people on it. One of the people he trained, Carl Pearson. You may have heard of him, Pearson Correlation. Well, he was a student of Galton. Uh, yes, Carl Pearson also believed white people were the supreme race. He also believed that statistics could become the grammar of science to create the predictions of how to create a great race. And so um, he's actually, credit. we can credit him to be one of the first people to do an educational study. It's great. Let's look at it. So, you know, I've been talking about a math SAT a lot. Well, he also found a gap, right? Like, remember when I told you the way we do education research is we find a gap? Well, he found a gap in intelligence. Um, it was not between white and Latinx people. We're talking about Britain a long time ago. Uh, so instead of using SATs, let's use this thing called average intelligence score. And so he said adults should have an average intelligence score of 100, right? So he went to British schools, right? and tested a bunch of white children in Britain. I was like, look, you know, boys get an average score close to 100 and their kids are still developing. So that's why they're slightly low, right? Look, girls, close to 100, lower than boys, totally makes sense. Um, now I need to make a comparison, right? Because that's what science is about. So he went and went to a school and this school is a school that took uh, refugee children. Jewish refugee children. And according to his test, on average, Jewish boys will score 4.32. Uh, Jewish women will score, girls will score minus 43.12. And remember, the average intelligence score was 100, right? So we found a gap. There's a gap, you see? There's a gap. Uh, we simplify the model, and he would write things as the effect of race in IQ, literally the thing that is written on the paper. Um, yes, like when I wrote the effect of gender in, right? Deterministic, genetically, right? And the conclusion of this paper was that taking on average and uh, regarding both sexes, the, this alien Jewish population is somewhat in fear physically and mentally to the native population. And after this paper, he would actually go on because he was a very important man and try to convince the government to forbid the entrance of Jewish refugees uh, to the United Kingdom <clears throat> because if we kept letting them in, they would pollute the uh, native population. Um, so they were not the best people and we should not let them in because we are going to suffer as a consequence. I know most papers in education don't say things like this, and I'm not saying most papers in education are trying to make on purpose white supremacist sticks. But when you look at the majority of papers in education that use quantitative methods, they use a pretty similar system where they're using measures that they're not sure are actually reliable in different populations, uh, where they simplify models, where they reduce to variables uh, that should not be the mechanistic causal link to it, because that is how we model it, 
when you put race in a regression model, that is what you're saying. I don't care if you say that is not what you're saying. That is what you're saying mathematically. You're saying the variance of this variable is explained by race. Right? And we make conclusions that are focused on how marginalized students are failing to reach this bar, this magic bar of whiteness. That is what a positivism has given us. The problem is that we don't question it, right? We don't question this process. We don't question that we keep doing the same things that people were doing when they were eugenics was a thing, right? And we just forgotten eugenics was the origin of a lot of the things we do in education. Um, and we keep going with it because we get cloaked on this idea that because we're using numbers and we're using statistics, we're being objective and we're getting to the truth. So instead of using positivism, what I'm saying is that we should use criticalism. So what I'm saying is when you're studying human situations, you should use the system of theories that recognizes the system is rigged and terrible. And that requires you to read a bunch of people that don't use numbers to tell the story, right? But that they have gone to actually understand what's happening. And now we have to do the work of thinking about how do we translate to this in a way that honors the experiences of the marginalized, not how we think people can reach a bar or don't. And I know after all these things, you may be thinking like, well, yeah, you have given us this whole speech. Do you have an example? As I said, I don't have a full answer, but I do have some start to it. Um, the first thing is uh, that we should start doing this sort of like gap gazing fetish where we look at things about how we don't meet this white male achievement bar and how we're failing to get to it. Right? The first is because like uh, it does not contextualize the systems of oppression, right? It's not saying why students are not getting to this bar or like the significant barriers that students face to meet this bar. But also because that is inherently thinking about students in like a very bad way, right? Like it forces us to think about students in ways of laziness, underrepresentation, about gaps, about them being poor, about the things that they lack, not about the things that either they bring or the systems that are actually keeping them there. So in a work I've been doing with my collaborators, uh, Vanessa Ralph, Katie Husvin, uh, Megan Deshay, uh, we did a review of papers in chemistry education research that use the uh, word equity, and we found that more, over 50%, uh, so about 59.4% of, of papers that use the word equity actually use deficit perspectives to explain what's happening to students. And by deficit perspective, I'm saying they're talking about students as if people have fault of not meeting this bar. We're starting with the things that they lack, not the things that they have. Um, so it's important to contextualize systems of oppression. The second thing is that we need to look for em emancipation, not amelioration. So amelioration means that we are trying to just semi-improve the things. And usually this means that we use words like uh, people should be more resilient. People should use grit. People should persevere all the odds, right? And so then we're like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. The students didn't persevere enough through all these obstacles that I put as an institution so I will never graduate. Like, it's not my fault. They didn't try hard enough. Um, and so this requires to change from thinking from the individual level. So things that students are doing like great and perseverance to actually the system, right? What is the system doing to be an obstacle? Also makes us question what a lot of these things says. So as I say, like we think of these things as subjective, right? Grit. Uh, I'm going to show you how we measure grit in education. So we measure grit uh, and resilience with this questionnaire. Typically, this is a very famous questionnaire. It's very used, highly cited. Um, and these are the set of questions. The set of the questions are like, I often set a goal, but later choose to pursue a different one. Uh, I have difficulty maintaining my focus on projects that take more than a few months to complete. I am diligent and I never give up. Um, there's a couple of problems here. First, if you are neurodivergent and you have ADHD or something along those lines, this question is the set of the questions you would get to get diagnosed with ADHD, right? So like, I actually failed this test I have taken it many times and I usually come out with somebody with really low grit. Uh, and so in theory, right, I should not have a PhD uh, because I have very low grit according to this thing. But the other thing is that we're not actually talking about what is person. Like, look, it's not the same 
to go through not give up obstacles when you're a first generation student, right? Than when you're a multi generational university student. Like, there's no way that we're interpreting this thing the same, right? The bar is totally different, right? The bar of resilience is totally different, right? But we're not doing anything to try to understand that, right? We're using this very generalized sort of thing that is depending a lot about how students are interpreting it to define whether we can predict whether it will stay in college or not. Um, the other thing is that we need to ground things in social historical context. So, for example, the Royal Society, um, you know, the science session of the United Kingdom uh, invested in slavery, you know, for a while. Uh, so that means that the money they had, they said, hmm, what if we invest on slaves and the earnings we get through it, we use it to fund science. So a lot of the science that was funded through that time and was given to researchers as grants to study, you know, things that we consider basic science right now or seminal work in chemistry and physics and biology uh, was funded through slavery, literally. Like, literally. That is where the money came from. That is how the Royal Society enriched themselves. Um, for example, the president of the Royal Society around this time is somebody called Robert Boyle. And if you're a chemist, you have heard of Robert Boyle, Boyle's Law, Gas Law. So yes, this dude that we talked about in our classrooms um, totally signed up on being like, less than maintenance delivery, and use this money to fund science, right? So it doesn't matter that people agreed with slavery back here, by then, right? The point is that a lot of the work that we consider seminal of science, right? The reason we were able to do it was thanks to investing on in this thing, right? And that matters. Telling those stories matter. Recognizing that social historical context matters. But I'm going to give it to you a more contemporary example. One of the things love in this world, people love standardized testing because it's really easy to give to a lot of people, uh, right? They're really scalable. They're supposed to give you really important things. The SAT is supposed to predict how good you're going to do in your first year in college, blah, 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 blah. Well, uh, Carl Brigham actually uh, was somebody that uh, produced this work called The Study of American Intelligence. Uh, I know you will be shocked to know that this study in American intelligence was about what about was about how white people were smarter than the rest of people, especially black people. Um, and so he was totally he published this thing. And after he published this thing, right, the college board was like, "Hey, we like your ideas. Don't you want to come and develop the exam? We're going to use to decide whether people can enter in college or not." So Carl Brigham went to the college board and designed this test called the SAT. The SAT has not changed that much since then, right? It's not like we have a completely different test that measures things completely different. The basis of the theory why the SAT of the, what the SAT measures, how it measures it, the purpose of it, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's still the same, has not changed. And the reason and the logic behind it was that this test should be able to distinguish between white people and non-white people to prove that white people were superior and are the only people that should be allowed in college. Um, and this is currently the thing we're using to decide whether people get into rigorous institutions, selective institutions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's a couple of other things that I'm still figuring out how to do. Uh, how do you tell a counter story with numbers, right? If the story we keep telling is the story about how we fail as marginalists, about how we are the problem, about how there's no solution, right? How do we tell a story with numbers that actually magnify their stories, their experiences, their narratives? It's not even possible. Some people will say it's impossible, right? You cannot do this with numbers. Um, how do we actually change the way like education and not only like as research about again the dashboards your university is publishing the analytics like canvas is giving you to really talk about what these things mean what they're telling us about students um so i hope this talk has given you some reflection about how this is not about bad people that grab data and manipulate it to make marginalized people be bad this is about how we have not questioned the origins of data, the way we do it, the methodologies and the history of the way we do it. And so no matter the good intentions we come in, 
if you will use a method or a process that is embedded in white supremacy, we're going to get white supremacy as a result. I want to thank my co-authors in the paper of uh, the, the Equity Review and people that I've been thinking about a, a lot about this thing with. Uh, Dr. Catherine Husband, now it's a postdoc uh, here, it says ECU, but now she's a postdoc at University of Michigan. Dr. Vanessa Rall, postdoc at University of Wisconsin-Madison. These are my scholar sisters, the people I, I, I work a lot with them. We belong to the same field, right? We spend a lot of time talking about these things. Uh, and Megan Deshay, she's, uh, she was a master's student at the Ryan Still Love. Um, and so she also was part of this uh, effort. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the mentors that I had in the past. Christian Shaw, my PhD advisor, Kevin Binning, my postdoc advisor at the University of Pittsburgh, and Tim McKay, my current postdoctoral advisor at the University of Michigan, and the CES featured leaders in chemistry program in ACS, because if you liked how I told my story, well, there's some of the things they told me what, how to do. And thank you very much. Well, that was a really great talk. Uh, I, I know I had a bunch of questions and uh, we had some other ones as well. So if it's all right, we're just going to go ahead and jump straight in. Yeah. Uh, we'll get to the, the to the question and answer discussion section. Do I still uh, share? I'm really confused about what do I do. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 I still share. Yeah, I yeah, I tell you what, just go ahead and throw it back up in presentation. That way we can go, you know, if you need to go up okay. and forth the slides, we can do that. Perfect. That's probably the easiest way. Um, okay. So, first question here is, um, how do you how do you create a multivariate analysis to delineate identity? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I particularly have uh, stayed in a very univariate model. So, I, I do put uh, demographics or I can put other variables, but the way I conceptualize science identity is as one variable. Mm -hmm. uh, people like Dr. Catherine Husband has actually done the work to conceptualize this as very different variables that makes this more nuanced than what I've done in the past. Okay. Uh, so one of the things she has thought about is about um, what experiences have I had that make me feel successful? What experiences have provided me the success? Uh, what values do I have that match science? Mm -hmm. What kind of information I'm having back? So, that, so what she has done has actually broken down these things that I have more like as a general sort of thinking theoretically mm -hmm. into more measurable things, right? That we have thought about. And so sort of what we have thought about is, do you have experiences that have allowed you to have confidence? Do you have experiences that have given you a positive loop that you belong here uh, and your personal beliefs about it? Mm -hmm. And now as we're working together uh, to expand this, we're trying to add to this, okay, how is this different from the way you see yourself as somebody that is racialized. So how do you see your racial identity? What does it mean to you to be Latinx or black or Asian, right? And how do those characteristics are clashing or being equal to these other four things? Uh, so that is how we're thinking about it now. More as a like, are, is the way I see myself racialized similar to the way I see myself scientifically? But we still don't have results for that. This is just the start of our project. Okay. So I guess I'll, I'll follow up on that one with, with what you just talked about. Um, so like, you know, I'm, I'm a white guy in science is I'm trying to think of the way I want to word this. Um, so, so you said, so part of the, part of the identity is basically think, you're asking people to think about positive experiences and, and how that made them feel, I guess maybe made them feel welcome and, and, uh not like they're having to cross that that border that you talked about right or what things have made you feel successful when do you yeah. succeed in science right okay so is that something that can be influenced by like like you know i I'm, I'm a pi i have students you know from from various different backgrounds is that something that a pi can can i, I don't know if influence is the right word but like you know but if if i'm if i'm affirming who they are you know i'm not trying to force them to conform to like a specific notion, like, like you know, the examples you show, you know, you need to work 60 hours a week, you need to be in here on the weekend and weeknights and all that. Is that, is that something that helps? So or, I'm glad you asked this question. Uh, yeah. I, because Katie and I have been awarded uh, some seed funding from the Royal Society of Chemistry to study exactly that question. Okay. Uh, so we're working on it. We have some small seed funding as postdocs. You know, we don't have a lot of resources mm -hmm. to do independent research. Mm -hmm. If 
some of you hire us, we will have more research uh, resources and we can do this work and okay. give you results faster. But we yeah. are actually interested on do mentors influence this and how do they influence it? Yeah. And also, like, if you are a mentor, like, as you say, you're a white guy, right? Mm -hmm. And you have no idea how to support certain things. Can we find things to tell you this is what will be helpful? Yeah. Okay. Right? So not yet, but yes, we're thinking about it. So okay. stay tuned because hopefully, you know, maybe Katie should come and talk about it when we have results. That would be fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I would love to have her on. Uh, all right. Um, so the going, actually, this is kind of not a lot, not along the exact same lines, but similar talking about the, the idea of like a, what a quote unquote good chemist is. Right. Um, do you think that technology has, has at least started to undermine the idea that spending physical time in the lab equates to someone who is a good chemist or who does good work? You know, I mean, these questions are excellent. I love it. Yes, I do think like if you're part of uh, a more online community, I think every time one of these things comes out, people are really like make a point of telling, uh, no, this is not true. Mm -hmm. However, the other side is that technology also allows really powerful PIs to keep tweeting these things. True. And usually these things come out after really powerful current PIs, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to say names, uh, <laughs> tweet things that are like this, yeah. right? And then a lot of us come and say, hey, everybody is looking at this tweet of this really important person. I know they're really, really important. And you think what they're saying is like absolute truth, but we're here to tell you, right, yeah. why this is not true. And so what I want to do in the future is studies the sort of it really, like things that we're seeing in social media. Mm -hmm. and how we're taking these messages as junior scientists mm -hmm. um and uh and like are they making an impact or are we just like complaining on twitter uh yeah, right sure, and sure. which is valid if twitter is only for our venting purposes sure. right i'm not saying it's not but i do think it would be interesting to see this impact right oh, I so i can you. tell you anecdotally yes mm -hmm. scientifically i don't have an answer yet okay that's interesting yeah i mean an anecdotally I I kind of have a similar thing. My, so my my grad advisor, when I started in grad school, was really like, you know, he's like, Facebook's dumb. Mm -hmm. These days spend too much time playing around on social media. And even by the time I left, you know, in five years, it, he had already started, like he, he had gotten on board. He led ACS in... Um, Doing, doing I mean, almost something similar to this, but like like little short videos where like authors would make videos about their papers and like ACS would promote the videos to get people to pay attention to it. You know, and nowadays he's like, he's tweeting and <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like he's right. on social media. You know, I don't, and, and he, he was, I will say he was better than most, uh, most PIs that were his age. Like, you know, he had been, in, he had already been in the field for like 30 years when I started with him. And, you know, he, he, had some ideas of like need to work a good amount but he was also a lot more flexible with you know he cared more about like are you getting your stuff done then you need to be here this many hours a week you know between the this hour and this hour um but but it was interesting just again anecdotally it's interesting to see how he's been molded by social media and i, I would say has become uh less less of that quote unquote good chemist stereotype uh that that, that is actually really interesting because mm -hmm. he, he and he wouldn't fit the mold of someone that you would expect like i said you know he's he's i guess probably in his 60s at this point uh but is very active like i said very active on social media and everything else um all right so sorry next question no uh, it's okay is is okay so so you were talking about how uh in in the uh, historically and and you know even up to present day even um, that people take you know they, they they identify a gap they they break it down to a simple model and they quantify or they they make immutable characteristics deterministic right is there a reasonable way that you could try and quantify these immutable characteristics without making them deterministic. So acknowledging, you know, using numbers to show that there is a difference without saying the difference is because of this immutable characteristic. I think that is like a current thing the field is struggling with. I think uh, you would get different responses from different people. And I'm saying this as a preface because I don't want you like people that are not 
part of the field mm -hmm. to think that what I'm saying is a consensus sure. because we don't have it, right? Some people will tell you there's no way you can put brace in a model, okay. right? And actually get to like a thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think personally, I think that we can find ways of doing it when we talk about, you know, race instead of saying this is race right right this bible is gonna express whether you suffer racism or not in some level and maybe i cannot quantify the, the amount of racism right but i can say that if you identify as part of this group you will theoretically right get more racism than a white person sure so that is a way in which we can do it okay um not a hundred percent i think to the point right but I think the other ways that uh, a lot of the ways we sometimes use race is really uh, to make numbers bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, for example, would say Latinx, black people, anybody that is not a white or Asian, they go into the same variable, right? Sure. And so when we do that, we're sort of saying that cost, like the reason all this group of people are getting this result is the same and we're not differentiating between them. Mm -hmm. So I think a way in which we can make progress is by having this more disaggregated way of looking at data. But that required a lot of work in order to start like asking ourselves, sure. what does this mean? Yeah. Especially Asian, right? If you go like, if you get the data of, uh, so if you go, if you go to your register office and you get student data, students that I get uh, marked as Asian, you will get the data from two sources or uh, college application or whether they're international students based mm -hmm. on the country they come from. Yep. But uh, college application does not distinguish, or if they do when they put it in into a college application, the way the university gets this data, you lose where they came from. They're just marked the station. You don't know if they came from India or from China, from Japan, right? right. So you get this pan Asianism. Uh -huh. And I'm using Asian particularly as an example because there's a lot of different privileges experiences in, oh, in yes. Asia, right? Absolutely. Uh, and students actually get really different experiences and results depending mm -hmm. which country they come from. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think another way, like a way in which we make this more real to reality is by separating these variables, disaggregating these variables. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah your, your point about Asia in particular is, is I mean, you know, again, even in my limited experience, just the interactions I've had with different, you know, from students from India, China, Thailand, Vietnam, Japan, they all have wildly different backgrounds. Just, right. you know, again, like I said, you know, it's just in terms of life experience, right? Uh, and and so the immigrant experience is quite different, right? Sure. Like all of us immigrant students are like mm -hmm. put in the same bucket. Oh yeah. Coming to this country as like Mexican is not oh, the yeah. same as coming from another country from South America mm -hmm. or Central America. Not the same as how you experience uh, being an immigrant if you're coming from Europe or Asia, right? Oh, absolutely. There's different language barriers, mm -hmm. uh, but there's also different cultural closeness mm -hmm. that I think Mexico gets because of proximity mm -hmm. that allows me to like blend better culturally, okay. right? Sure. And so ergo like to pass, not as white, but as less, I'm going to use the word exotic, not because we're exotic, because this sure. is how people see us, yeah. right? And so I become this really cute thing that people are like, oh, she's a really cute little Latina. She's like loud and like really like consultation and stuff. It's like, but like, you know what? I become this really cute right. thing people can put in, don't feel threatened by. Sure. Where other groups of immigrants don't get that privilege, right? Like, even though it's horrible, like to be put in a box of like cuteness and exoticness, right? Mm -hmm. It brings some privilege. One of them is Absolutely, I don't see yeah. it as a threat, yeah. right? Um, so it's it's very problematic because we only have that mark as an immigrant. Right. We only have that mark as like non-native English speaker. Mm -hmm. Not the same being a right. non-native English speaker that whose language is Spanish, that whose language is yeah. Chinese, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, have you tried an even point Likert scale? I don't know what that uh, is, but <laughs> for what? Like, I, I, my question would be more about for what. So most of the variables that are for like identity, um, affective resources, like beliefs about things, we mm -hmm. use Likert scales in education, and there's some benefits to it. But I will like hesitate to tell you that they can be objective because sometimes different groups read these scales really differently, and we still need to do some tests to make sure uh, that different groups are interpreting the same way. 
And usually that work is not done. So we publish things using this measure without showing the evidence that uh, the way people are reading it is the same. And by that, I mean, is the interpretation of a question. Mm -hmm. So when I show, when I say like, oh, it's like the great thing. When I say like, are you, do you like, uh, when you find an obstacle, do you like fight to get through it? Right. right. We usually do look at how different groups are interpreting that question sure. and test both qualitatively like their answers but also mathematically there's ways to test where different groups are interpreting it their same way and usually that data is not run right how, how or not you, asked for how, how do you how do you do that uh so there's this thing oh my god uh is this thing called item response theory and what it does is look at uh, treats the responses of students and sees the probability of answering four in a Likert scale versus the probability of answering one, mm -hmm. right? And sort of sees what the probability is for each group. And if you see that a particular group, the probability of answering four is really, really high. Mm -hmm. That means that for that group, uh, the way they're interpreting it is like easy, right? If a lot of people in a question are asking like the very agree, right? Yeah. It's a very easy item to endorse for a group, but you see that another group is like not endorsing it as strongly, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. saying, eh, then you can say, well, they're interpreting this differently, right? Because why on earth with this question, right? right. For some people, it will be super easy to put a four in it. Yeah. Uh, but for other people, like you can test that probability. That is a simplified uh, okay. version of, 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 of a, like, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But sure, like, that is sure. a simplified way in which I can tell you this. Okay. No, that makes sense. Uh, and just to follow up the, so the, it was uh, Dr. Kothapali that asked the question about the Likert scale. And she said it was, she was, she was thinking, or she was referring specifically um, to the questions that you showed where they had like, you know, sure, somewhat, no, it was the, it was the five point scale. Oh yeah. So, so that is, okay. So usually Likert scale, so I'm going to show this, uh, uh sorry. I know what you're saying. So I just want a clarification because I should know my number of slides to know this. Thanks. Okay, here it is. So, so the Likert scale is this not at all, not much, somewhat, blah, blah, blah. And we're, in order to be able to put it in a model, mm -hmm. we need to give a value to that word. So we're designed that not at all means five. Yeah. Or all the time means one, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that is what a Likert scale is for people that are like asking, what is a Likert scale? Uh, it means that basically we're like, we can also make this scale larger, right? Mm -hmm. We can make it from one to 10, okay. right? You, can, you also have to test whether actually the energy, imagine this is activation energy, the activation energy from go, to go to not at all to not much. Mm -hmm. Is the same to go to not much to somewhat. Okay. What if the activation energy from not much to somewhat is much larger? That means that for, it's not four to three, right? It means that the right. unit is not one between them, right? The unit right. might be like two, right? Okay. Usually not tested either. Mm -hmm. If you extend the scale, sometimes you get really few responses in certain numbers. So maybe you will get a ton of people in 10, a ton of people in one, a ton of people in five. And almost nobody three and nobody two. So like a lot of your numbers become meaningless, right? Because not a lot of people are interested. So usually you should do a lot of testing to decide whether your scale is from one to five, one to 10, one to three. You should do a lot of testing to see, is it really a unit difference between each of these things? Mm -hmm. And if your question is like, of course you should do that. Do we do that? No, the answer is no, we don't do that. Uh, we could, some people do it, but it's not like required not for common. peer review. Yeah. It's not common. Okay. Um, okay. So we talked about the, the SAT and, you know, uh, the, the white supremacist origins and, and, you know, I, I th there's been a lot of discussion more recently about how basically it's not, uh, a good measure, um, of, of intelligence and all that. So. Is there a way that we could, uh, and I, again, I don't know if this is the right word, but it's the, the one that makes the most sense in my head. Can we fix the SAT or is it something that we just need to throw out? Completely? No, we just need to throw it away to the trash. Okay. There's no way to fix something whose basis is to define people by whether they're smart or not, okay. racially, right? right? There's no there's no way fixing it. We should throw it to the trash, okay. put it on fire, never talk about it again. All Include right. the URIs on that, please. 
Yeah, I, I would actually. Yeah, I would agree with that. We actually, I think we actually got rid of the GRE because of COVID this year. Yeah, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of hoping. But the SAT is still holding strong, right? Uh, yeah, I'm trying, to think, I'm trying to think if it was. I guess, I guess it still is at, at Carolina. I'm not sure. Uh, I know they, I, I know they put less weight on it for sure. I don't think they've gotten rid of it completely. So I mean, I I'm sure the college board will lovey against it, obviously, yeah. because they get a ton of money. Oh, but yeah. if you ask me, no, it should be thrown away in a trash, put it in a fire, and never talk about it again. Okay. Uh -huh. um, so in that case, it, is there any point, or again, I'm trying to think about the right way, how I want to translate what's in my head to what I'm saying. Is Should we have any kind of measure to check for a base level of knowledge that we would expect somebody to have coming out of high school. Okay, so this is very different, right? Okay. The SAT actually was created to measure intelligence. Uh, intelligence as a concept yeah. is immutable. So you add, like, they will tell you, in, like the way psychologists think about intelligence is immutable. That number should not change a lot between you being young and you being older. Like the test, they give you different tests depending on your age, right? But your score stays the same. Okay. So intelligence, when it was created as a concept, uh, especially related to race, right, is seen as this immutable thing. Mm -hmm. White people are smart, black people are not smart, period. There's no way to change it. This is how we were born. Right, okay. Knowledge. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is different, right? Measuring knowledge is different. Okay. However, right? When you look at the questions of the SAT, there's some questions about um, both language interpretation and uh, mathematical interpretation. So, like, if people will be like, but, like, how do, how do you know it's not measuring math knowledge, right? Why are you, like, how come you're saying this, right? Like, I see algebra there, right? Right. Um, the best way to tell you this is that you actually look at what projects doing well in the SAT is whether you have the money to be prepped for it. Yep. And so basically you're trained to answer a test that is multiple choice and has some tricks in the same way. Like if you prep, if you took a prep for a year, they give you all the tricks to pass the math test. Don't, don't lie about your, don't lie to yourself about it. Also like about the word test, the how to pass a word one is about passing a test is, the, is you need tricks and you need money to pass it. Thinking about measuring knowledge in chemistry, right? How do we know somebody understood a concept? It's a tension between structures thinking that their tests do it. Mm -hmm. And some people that do research saying, are you really though? Yeah. Uh, and there's, there's that I don't particularly study um, how to create a test to measure conceptual understanding or like in that sort of sense in chemistry that is not in my area of expertise. There's a lot of chemistry education researchers that are amazing that do this. Uh, so there's ways to do that, right? But when you look at the ways they do it and the ways they justify why the things they're showing you actually are testing knowledge or things that students know, you will notice that those questions have nothing in similar with a standardized test type of questions. Right. And there's a reason for it, right? Because the basis to it is really different. Mm -hmm. The philosophy behind it is really different. Sure. Right? Okay. Interesting. Um. Have you or have, have there been studies that looked at standardized testing in uh, Eastern countries, especially India and China? Not that I know of. I mean, in general, I mean, I'm sure you can find uh, standardized tests that are from those countries mm -hmm. and how they're interpreted. I am hesitant to make any claims, knowledge, or anything that has to do with um, Asian populations because mm -hmm. uh, not my lane, right? I'm yeah. not Asian. Not in my experience, and I try to not study things where I don't have some sort of like. If I were to have a student that identifies a member of that group that that is a question they feel really important to themselves, mm -hmm. I would give them all the resources to study it because that is something they can like understand culturally and sure. scientifically. Mm -hmm. I currently, right, I don't have a student that does that or a collaborator, okay. right? So I don't touch it. <laughs> That's fair. Not because I don't think it's important. I don't think it's important. It's because I believe that these questions actually need some knowledge of being part of the live experience of it. Yeah, absolutely. And that is just part of my research philosophy. No, I, I think that's a good one because because like you said, there, you know, it, it'd be you know, if if I looked at you know your your background I, because I haven't lived that background, I'm going to miss things or miss exactly things that that you know you understand because you you. Right. Literally lived it. 
So, no, that, that makes perfect sense. So, yeah, I don't know. Not looked at it, but also I... Not my lane. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I guess we'll, I'll do... If anybody wants to ask any more questions, feel free to get them in. I'll, just, I'll ask one more that I have. Just more of a broad, open-ended kind of thing. Um, so, sort of... What, basically, what, what are our next steps, right? Like, like ju it, again, generally speaking, I know I know you, you don't have, like, a magic silver bullet. <laughs> no, 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 it's it, okay. But, like, just more speaking more broadly, like, what, what are we, what kind of things can be done to, you know, up, upset the status quo, more or less? I love it. So if I magically tomorrow had a startup and a department and a lab, mm -hmm. uh, the way I would start like doing more deep research on this problem would be first. Okay. I think one of the first things that we need to do is go back to the populations we're claiming to study and help mm -hmm. and uh, understand better how they're seeing themselves and how they're like, I think we need a little bit more of qual work. And then we need to compare that qual work that some some this has been done already. Like I'm not claiming that qual work don't, does not exist; that a lot of people have done it. But like maybe we need to do it some a little bit deeper in certain things. Mm -hmm. And we need to start questioning the way we collect data and the kind of data we are collecting in institutions. Okay. And uh, we need to start pressuring institutions to stop collecting data in the wrong way, right? Because right now I think even though we can do some research with the data that exists, mm -hmm. it comes with a lot of. Um, However, in my methodology section, these are all my limitations, and they're always going to be limitations, but I think there's many things that we can improve that is more representative of lived experiences. So that's step one. Uh, step two, I would also do more work on understanding how instructors are interpreting this data. Mm -hmm. So if you were to give up instructor a report of their class and say, this is how many marginalized students pass your class, how does the instructor interpret that? What are their beliefs about why students are not passing in their class? Like, why are they, like sort of like the ideas they're already bringing into the classroom about why students are not passing or not passing. And I think we need to start looking at this mismatch of expectations between students and teachers and mentors and students. So if we look at this mismatch of expertise, we don't fix the problem, we start figuring out what the problem is. Okay. Uh, so that will be number two. Uh, number three, you start doing a lot of studies trying to tell the counter story of the current theory, like the current narrative, right? Mm -hmm. And you make a lot of mistakes about it. Sure. Uh, and 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 uh, finally, I think something that is very close to my research philosophy is that any work that I'm doing, uh, even if it's theoretical, it is, we need to start thinking about uh, policy impact and how to push our institutions for change. Because as long as it stays on papers, it doesn't change. And so that means raising your voice. Okay. And complain and say this is not okay and I'm not going to stand for this. Um, and so it's a mix of this sort of like activism and research, right? That uh, in science, we sometimes think should not go together. Uh, but I actually think it's actually necessary to upset the status quo. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but if you're marginalized and you're doing organic chemistry or physics or nuclear physics, I don't know how physics works, <laughs> uh, or biology and you study cells, <laughs> right? Or animals or whatever. Yeah. Um, I want you to know that your existence is disruptive. Your presence is setting the status quo and, and you should not feel pressured to do more than what you're doing right now because I don't want students to feel like they need to put more labor into the place that is giving them trauma. Uh, I'm freely choosing to study this and try to find solutions to that, but that is my personal uh, research choice. Mm -hmm. But I want to remind people that existing in a place that doesn't want you there, yeah. it's upsetting the status quo in a way mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and staying with you in solidarity on it. Nice. Um, so uh, the last thing, actually, yeah, no, I think that, that, that's perfect. Good. <laughs> that's really well said. <laughs> so I think that's all the questions we have. Uh, Dr. Kothapali did recommend, um, if you don't follow, she said, uh, follow Ben Hetty on Twitter. Apparently he posts. Uh, uh, yep. You do? All right, good. Yep. We, we, Ben and I share some philosophies, don't share another ones. That doesn't mean he's not a good researcher. He's actually a great researcher. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> but we share some philosophies, we don't share some philosophies. And I think that is part of the fact that the field is changing in the way it's thinking about things. And I think this disagreement is what is going to push us forward. That's um, that it, These tensions are actually what move the field forward. Mm -hmm. um, 100%. And so there's no consensus, right? We are not, we don't have a consensus of how to solve this. Sure. Uh, and I think 
the work he's doing, the work I'm doing, the work many people are doing is what like, and the clash of it is what's going to get us to like better results for students. But I appreciate also the recommendation. 100%. Yeah. No, the, the, the clash of ideas is, is where you, like you said, I mean, that, that's how you get better, right? Like you know, if, if all you do is publish something and pat yourself on the back and say, I am, I am great. I know exactly what I'm doing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with my work. You don't, you never improve on it. Right. And so, you know, that's that's the, the good science is able to stand up to a challenge. And this is the field that, again, we have no consensus. Right. Uh, so, like, you would see less stability that you would expect than, like, right? We don't have consensus in the sense mm. of, like, this is how carbon works in organic molecules. We, sure. don't, we don't have that. <laughs> yeah. Right? We, we're not at that level mm -hmm. of stability, right? And yeah. so when you're not at that level of stability, uh, you're going to see things that are like be like, why is Ben he saying this and why is Paulette saying this? Mm -hmm. And they look like things that don't match. Is one, like, I actually don't know who's right. Oh, sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Uh, we're figuring out. Uh, we're making a lot of mistakes on the way, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's the, I mean, that, that's, that's what science is, though. Like, that's, mm -hmm. that's how research is. You know, no, nobody gets it exactly right. So, right. Uh, you know, yeah, the, you have to, you have to keep working and basically, you know, like it's just continuous improvement over time. And that's how we, exactly. that's how we make things better. Well, I think that's all the questions we got. So, um, I, I will say thank you again, uh, Paulette, uh, like I said, fantastic talk. Um, if I thank you for just one minute, um, we will, we can chat briefly. Yeah. Um, for everybody oh, hi, I'm there. Yeah, you're <laughs> fine. Um, for, for everybody else, uh, you know, thank you for coming out. Um, we will be off next week, uh, and I will be looking for a presenter for the week weeks after that. Uh, but in the meantime, have a great weekend. Uh, I'm going to guess that probably everybody that, that is listening has gotten vaccinated if they can. But if you haven't for some reason, please go get vaccinated. They're really good. Uh, wear a mask and... Um, we will see you, uh, like I said, not not next week. Hopefully, the week after that. Um, if if you can follow me on Twitter at Megan's Lab, that's I post all the stuff up there. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. So thank you, everybody. Have a good night, and uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>